tell you, but the film media is one of the most powerful medias there is. For instance, maybe 20, 20 30 years ago, we thought TV was going to take over. And it's a pain in the neck, TV, but it's not really taking over. The most influential thing we could do is film. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know if I told Sheba, I have my, one of my daughters is, uh, is, is as good as Yo-Yo Ma. I mean, she's phenomenal. She's in the Eroica Trio, which is the number one piano trio in the world. Okay, they're great, they're beautiful, so what? How do they get to be number one? Not by the fact that they were good, but they went to Hollywood and they got a Hollywood screen, uh, Hollywood publicist, mm -hmm. put them on with a Barbara Walters show, every conceivable thing. And my whole family is dedicated to trying to spread what these arts do and do for people. And a lot of people think that, you know, the arts, oh, I can get along without it. Or oh, I can get along without music. It's impossible. You think, oh, by the way, it's like air. I can get along without air. You can't. It, you, everybody goes to the movies. You, what happened is they thought TV would take over, but no. People go to the movies instead. They want to be away. They want to be centered on that. So that's the time if we can grab them. But that's the hidden agenda. My friend Patty Moon says, don't tell people too much about this yet. Because I want to build you know, the other. So what, what, uh, I, what you do is you, you, if you make it interesting to the people, then it, all of a sudden they get captured by it. Mm -hmm. And part of the problem is that we, as musicians and artists, we make ourselves the elite. And we make it for the elite people. And that's not what we want to do. We want to make it for everybody. Now, you say, I don't need music. You go to the movies, and that's what's behind all those movies. And that's what I'll, I'll show you. Okay, so now I'll... That's what I'm trying to build. Now I'll digress. Okay, okay while, now, you, while this, you're taking your cello out, I'd like to uh, add something here. Yes. I hear the way in which you describe uh, that, how would I say, the seduction isn't into anything else but to, into, to their own soul. What you want people to, to get back, when, when, when somebody says, I've never tried to paint, I've never tried to, to write a poem, and so on and so forth, and they get the opportunity, so instead of dealing with outside of themselves, they go inside of themselves to, to find out, and then something begins to grow and go come to life again inside of them that have deadened over. That's so true, and... Um, Oh, there's so so many things. I, I could tell you what has happened just even in the last couple days, the things that have happened. I mean, there's so many things. And it's very interesting for me because I'm about to retire. And at times it's hard. I have nightmares. And oh, because I've always been busy rather than be still and know that I am God. And that's what I'm working with now. Be still and let, you know, this come, what, what's going to come to us. But there, that whole idea of, of, of being still and finding the source of who you are, where is it coming from, that's so important. And I need it to stay alive. I need to be, you know, doing this. Mm -hmm. uh, but anyway, so, okay. Oh, this is, well, now, this is my companion. I'm going to tell you some interesting inside information. This is my companion for... Oh, about 35 years. Uh -huh. And um, it's a Carlo Tononi, 1726. Oh, isn't that gorgeous? And um, the interesting thing about this is it's not a very popular instrument, probably a lot of more strands than this mm -hmm. maker. The man who's replacing me. Two interesting facts here. He's great talent. He's 25 years old. Oh my God. He's Asian. And think about that. Because mm -hmm. Right now, incredible things are coming from China. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is, the instrument he plays is a tononi. Mm -hmm. So the audience that's heard me play for 37 years, um, that instrument, uh, you're going to hear a very similar sounding instrument. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it, that's, I thought that was kind of interesting. I mean, how many... How often does something like that happen? So anyway, what I do is I, I tell people, I'm, I'm not going to bore you guys for long, but, but anyway, um, this, this instrument that you're looking at was invented 
1550, almost 500 years old. How the hell could it be relevant to today? I mean, what, what on earth could, could make this relevant? Well, you think of this. <laughs> Could be a Star Wars. Or is it a and then you can do this, uh, Darth Vader. So it, it's very relevant. So um, what? What? Uh, um, but what is this? purpose of this particular instrument, for instance, in an orchestra. An orchestra is like a metaphor for life. Every one of us has a purpose in life. Everybody has a purpose. God has a purpose. No matter where you are, what you're doing, where you're sitting, he has a purpose for you. And in the orchestra, each one of these things has a purpose. And uh, Beethoven was, you know, he, he sort of discovered where, where's, where's the cello supposed to be going on? Well, you know, in Beethoven's fifth. We play with everybody else. How exciting! The violins are playing. Hey, us. Oh, we get to play again. Isn't that exciting? Oh yes. Oh no. Oh, that's what we get. So, we're playing accompaniment. We're playing a bass. Oh, is that it? Oh, no. But he knew we were a singing instrument. So. He's had us start the second movement. So he knew that this was singing in every, that's the second movement is a theme and variation, so he has us play that. So, uh, now, the cello can play fast, too. But that's not what the violins are better at, that is. We're for singing. So what I do when I do this shtick I have is uh, I have the, uh, um, I, I say, look, and this came out of, of a, a conversation I had with a group of people who were, and young, one young preacher, man was going to be a preacher, and he was arguing about what the truth was, and that there was an ultimate truth, and that was the truth. And, and so I, that night, and we, it was friendly, but it was an incredible, interesting discussion with about 12 people there, and very intellectual people, you know, that were not going to buy that there was only one truth. Uh, but etc. So it was hard to, you know, but anyway, so that night I thought about something, that's what I've introduced to this, and I said, there is an ultimate truth. And that truth, for instance, to give you an example, is these are these notes. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. But that note is this note. Those are all C's. Yeah. So the, all the others are twelve notes here. That's the truth. But Pythagoras was right. Yeah, that's the truth. Except, look at what happens. Let's take four religions. Mm -hmm. Let's oh, take God. each religion has the truth. But it's, it's still the ultimate truth. It may look a little different, but look. Have music in the mosque, but that's a religious song outside. They took those 12 notes. 
You know, the funny thing is that while they may not have it during the, in, in the mosque in itself, I was in Cairo during Ramadan, and Ramadan they fast during the day and they feast at night. And so I was in one of those uh, uh, holes in the wall where they were celebrating, and they had this little one string violin with, uh, on, skin, uh, on skin box, highly amplified. A and little, little louder, please. Huh? A little louder. They had it. Uh, they they were playing a violin, and they were this the kind of of trill, uh, so mimicking the voice of the movie. No, that's exactly right. Hmm? That's that's exactly. The, they take it's it imitates the chant that's in the mosque. You're that's absolutely right. right. That's why that sounds like that. That's right. And I'm not totally accurate, by the way, because that's a that's an arranged. That's my interpretation yeah. of what I. Heard and what music I got. It's a little but, bit more European than yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's the style and at one key. Well, you know, and then so okay, let's take Catholicism. Here's another twelve, the same twelve notes, and you can, and, and each composer reflects the mood of the people at the time in a way. Take for instance, this is you all know this for the. Uh, Judaism. This is Before you do, I tell you a story. <laughs> it was, it was in, in uh, the middle of the winter in Manitoba. Now, can I use some of this stuff? <laughs> yes, you can. It's, it's, it's shared. But I don't think... Well, anyway, so I'm walking mm -hmm. through um, the difficult weather with the wind chill factor. It was about 70 below. It was very cold and I was wearing this heavy fur. I come to synagogue and usually the people who were there barely we have a quorum for the service and just the old timers. It came to a certain section in the prayer uh, where you can expand a little bit with a melody. So I began, Me Koma Isn't that oh, that's So they didn't know what it was. But afterwards, he came over to me and said, what a beautiful melody you used today. <laughs> what a Kedusha, you know? Aww. They didn't know that. But I, I, just, I just wouldn't dare it at a time when the younger people were there who may have known what that is, and then they would have rebuilt. But the old timers didn't have uh, That's a very to worry story. about that. Right? That's a great story. And it, it reminds, I want to write a book called God Speaks to Me. Mm -hmm. Oh, he speaks to you too. Is that's the, the um, we all, uh, but uh, this is this is interesting. Um, okay, now you were gonna give us a Jewish Jewish song. This is prayer by yeah. Block. Now, what's different about this and everything else is you can hear um, a lot of things in this music. The music varies greatly. Moods change. Thoughts. Now, my daughter has uh, just uh, released a record called Dreaming which has this on it. And we, we talked about what different parts of the music meant. And she said, no, Dad, no, that's not what it means, Dad. No, he's saying this. Here. And I said, no, no, Sarah, I think it means this. So I tell people what I think. I hear great humility in this. I will tell you, I'll talk as I go through. I hear exaltation, the glorious of God. I hear pleading. 
I hear, uh, you know, a, a sort of as all different qualities. And this is by Bloch, uh, Ernest Bloch. Uh, another miracle. To me, life is a miracle. I can't even be in an airplane without seeing the miracle. I remember he said, I will give you dominion over the earth. Mm -hmm. People don't see this this way. For me, holy cow, look what God's doing. Oh, you thought up the gasoline and all, and it, you got it, wasn't it convenient that it works out that Gasoline has enough energy that you can put it in a container and get it in an airplane and then go up in the air. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's interesting. And one of those great brain surgeons in this country, he's actually the husband of our cook. And we were looking at cactus, all these incredible cactus he has plants. And he says, oh yeah? You know, he says, you think that's just dust from dust that that came out of, of uh, random? No. If that flower is designed so incredible. God, to me, is so obvious. He's so apparent in everything that we see. It's, but we don't see it. We, we see something, oh, yes, we have hands and fingers and thumbs. Isn't that convenient? It just evolved. Oh, how exciting. Bullshit. If you're, if you're half a scientist, how can you not see that this is beyond our, our comprehension? 
how great that is. So anyway, I, I go into I go. I tell that. you, you fit right in because we were talking about <laughs> the issues of intelligent design uh, earlier. And that doesn't mean you take creation literally, and at the same time you recognize the vast, vast way in which it all comes down from God. It's incredible. But also, that's something you said. Yeah. Uh, by the way, there's a wonderful book, and I don't know if I told you about it, but uh, it's called The Search for God by Marchette Schutz. I did tell you about this book. And what, to me, is amazing about this... Hi, my daughter, Mr. John. Oh, oh, hi, daughter. I'm glad to see you. But I... I that's all right, but I want to tell you something. In that, she brings out it's a it's it's a um, it really basically it's talking about the Bible, and it goes to the historical side because you know there are other things that were written at the same time as the prophets and people were writing, and it's incredible. And when you 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 were able to put that into um, your singing, the synagogue, yes, uh, and. Um, Many Christians have no idea, realize that uh, do unto others as you would do unto yeah. you. It was all there before right. in Judaism. Right. And there are a whole, and a whole bunch of this stuff comes out in, um, in the book, you know, about what, why and what were the ears doing and where, why Isaac and Abraham, why that story is in there, what happened. You know, there were, people were getting deviant. They were going off and killing people. Mm -hmm. to, and this story was brought home to people, this is not what God wants. This has nothing to do with, you know. So it's a very interesting, uh, I, I, I thought when you brought that in, I thought oh, I'd have to give you credit for something else that was that is there. So anyway, my last one I do is I do Bach. Yeah. Because Bach wrote what I play for you. You know, it, 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 what you just said reminds me, there's a story that's just appeared in the Israeli newspapers that in the last will, of Naomi Shemer, who wrote the Yerushalayim Shel Zahav, Jerusalem of Gold, which probably is the most popular piece of yeah. music outside of Hatikva in Israel. Really? Oh. She acknowledged, it was like a deathbed confession, that the melody is not hers. That she oh. got it from some, I think it was a Bulgarian mm -hmm. uh, uh, composer. But she felt that she needed to give, uh, on her deathbed, the acknowledgement of that it wasn't hers yeah but it's it interesting yeah you know well you see this last one i'll do is protestantism and this really has nothing to do with the religions it has to show what all these things but to go to this acknowledging um and so it's whenever i do these things i learn from each person and each and then i start adding that to this whole thing that i'm doing hi nice uh, this is John. hi how are you um but um bach wasn't Old fogey. His kids Lots of them. surpassed him. You know, at the time they were popular. Stay in the background, Johan. Um, he was kind of a crazy guy too. At one point, he almost strangled a, a bassoon player because he didn't play well in the church or something. He was thrown in jail at one point because he wouldn't do what his patron told him. He left the church at this one point, went out, and uh, at this point, when he, this was being written. 1720, he was writing secular music, except he never wrote a, an ounce of secular music. Everything was attributed to God. It's in all the stuff and you do. I, I have another skit that I do, is, which is called Muses, uh, Angels and Heavenly Inspiration, where I prove that God wrote this music. And I do it through, you know, it's, it's good humor. Uh -huh. But I do it, it makes you think a little bit, but I do it through the fact that um, what Beethoven wrote, what Bach, what Haydn wrote, what Handel wrote, what they said in little, little stuff, mm -hmm. and um, then then certain facts, and which I'm going to come back to Bach on this. That Mozart um, asked where did it come from. He said, "I don't know." He said, "When I feel free, then it flows into me." And then oh, and he wrote to his father, "You know, all music has already been written. It just hasn't uh, has already been created. It just right. hasn't been written down. Right? All been created hasn't been written down." What is he saying when he says that? Um, then, you know, it's just, it's okay, then take an example of Beethoven. He can't hear a blessed thing, and the music is pouring in. You try to exist, for instance, you, you, you will probably hear, as it happens to me, the last tune you heard is what keeps ringing through your ear. Well, for 20 years, Beethoven didn't hear a thing, except he did. Something was coming into his consciousness, mm -hmm. and that music 
you know, it's like, you know, if you want, uh, the, the scripture says, uh, if you want to search for me, search for me with all your heart. But if you want to listen to Beethoven's last works, you've got to search with all your heart. But when you hear it, it, it is incredible. Well, and then take Schubert. Schubert's dying of syphilis. He wrote some of his greatest music ever. He's in pain. He's, he's going on. He's, he's not going to stop. Survived, right? and, and he goes on. Well, get back to Bach. Sorry when you hear some of this. Uh, Bach. Um, which, excuse me, which piece of, of, of Schubert are you talking about? Because Death and the Maiden is an example. Right, right. Uh, the, you know, it starts out. Uh, <laughs> That's death. And anyway, but later, it is, it is gorgeous melodies come. Yeah. And that it was, it was, it, and it was interesting. And you know, it, it, oh, I, and I, I, that's just going. But anyway, I'm just. Come Hello. Thank you. I'm just delivering the flowers. Thank you. I'm sorry. I'm going to somewhere right now. Okay. Bye-bye. Blessings. Good Shabbos. Well, Bach, when he wrote this... Oh, that's nice. She is a horticulturist and a... Mm. Mm. And the florist, and she knows I, I love lilacs. Yeah, I love lilacs. It's the season, too. Well, when he wrote this music, he was out of the church for a while. But, you know, if you go into his, his room where he's living, and you've got ten of his kids writing the music out, next door you have kid, boys in a dorm banging and making noise. Can you imagine this life? He just, and um, he's already old hat, but he still is writing. And um, just like this is old, he was old. But look what he creates. We don't hear his son's music hardly at all. Right. That they were the most popular at the time. Mm -hmm. But we hear, we hear his music. And um, this piece was uh, from a suite, um, and it's uh, you probably all know it. But before I do, I, I'll tell you some other interesting things that might be interesting to you because I I see it all as a miracle anyway. Um, the bow was invented um, in 1848, so. This was 1,500, look at how many years. <clears throat> and then what happened with this bow was that they could then begin to play loud and soft. You know, the piano was coming out around 1,700. And now, unlike the harpsichord, it could play loud and soft. That's why they call it pianoforte. Mm -hmm. And so that the, the bow, you could, before it was a, well, by Mozart's time it was flat, but it was not still effective. But before that was an arch, and when you pressed, you didn't get much of a sound, and the sound on the viols, which were the big family at the time of instruments, not the cello, not the not the violin family, the viol family. It sounded. <laughs> that was the size style of the sound. So this bow, what happened is that it was curved cur this way. Now, if you press hard. You can get louder. Watch, I'll show you. I'll give you an example. Oh, wait, something's wrong. Oh, well, I can't just press louder. That's, we can press now, but something else has to happen. And that's another one of these miracles. I have to move the bow. Watch where it goes, down towards the bridge. You see why I missed moved it now? I want to go, I do it that way. Oh, I want to go soft. I go up like that. I want to go fast bow. I want to go fast bow here. I get this, like ice skate, which is used then. The timber is changing. Vivaldi's Four Seasons, the the winter. That's the ice. Okay. So and then, but I can play slow bow here like this. But when you look at a symphony orchestra, that's another miracle. I look at an orchestra now, and I holy cow, hundred people all playing together. Each has their own thing. And, but in the strings, watch them, because they're all doing all of these things that I'm doing. For instance, how do I change the bow? Doesn't sound good. Why, what? I can make a good sound. How do I do it? So what here is I go up, the bow keeps going, I bring it back. So, uh, now, how do I do it out here? I don't do any flipping out there. I go, I stop the bow, take the pressure off, 
reapply and go. But you, it's so fast you don't see it. Okay, now how about when I shift? Because you know I, I did. Uh, I could have played that. I could have played it on this string as opposed down to here. I can move my hand all over it and get different places. How do I hide when I go the the swan? How do I hide that sound? Stop the bow, pressure off. But it's so fast your eyes can't see. Miracle. Miracle. And this is why I uh, tell people, take up a string instrument, you'll avoid Alzheimer's. Because it is so, you have to think so much, it breaks through the plaque for you. So here it is. that slide because I like that slide see right. but but so so all of that is so happening the, the 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 wonderful thing is that you're everybody gives credit to the left hand but they don't know the credit they have to give to the right hand no, and this is what true. you have just explained oh yes and not only that but I have to get it too yeah. uh, I have to tell you something uh, see what? I call, well, I'll tell you something else, too. This is vibrato. And that adds a beauty to the sound that's, that's incredible. And it isn't going back and forth. It's going back and up to the note. Now, I always thought I had a great vibrato. And, um, but uh, the concert master of our orchestra, David Hale, has one of the most beautiful vibratos, and I call him Seabiscuit, because if you know the story about mm -hmm. Seabiscuit, that he was built in a certain way, and that's the way David's vibrato is. And we were playing with Peter Ungen, the conductor, and we had this, these huge solos. It was just incredible. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I just want to do the... Uh, And uh, there I've, I loved his vibrato very much. This is going to go with what you were saying. But there was one place here I have to Im imitate. And I said, uh, Peter, oh, I said, I wish I'd get that, that vibrato. He said, no, you have that vibrato. Just use, use a faster bow. Use a faster bow. So, uh... A sound that was like you know it was very interesting actually both times I did fairly fast I, I but before I was around it's a different kind of a sound so you're right it's about the bow and uh, and like uh, it's like Perlman yeah gave a uh, um, a talk on NPR and he was talking and, and it was all about the right hand, actually, and then he said, and now I haven't even talked about the left hand. <laughs> he didn't come into it the time. So anyway, you see, so while I play this piece, <coughs> you can watch and see the different things I do with my left hand, the different kinds of vibrato I use. No note is the same. Every note has a different purpose, and I will use different things where the bow will move. It will do all kinds of things. The vibrato will come and go. And you know this piece, huh? playing this piece, this is what I'd be playing. I wouldn't get that nice melody because it's a sweet, it's in the violence play. But I'm here in the room and I have control over all of you and I can do whatever I want. So anyway. <laughs>
can do things no other instrument can do. I'll tell you a story about Itzhak, but later, huh? The people who did What the Bleak Do We Know? Yeah, oh yeah. yeah. Bill Tiller is a friend of 40 years. Oh. He's a, a brilliant physicist. He was proving scientifically the relationship and interrelatedness of the smallest particle known and how one affects the, like the resonating notes, but that mm. it, it's pervasive throughout the universe. Mm. Yeah, it is. The oneness. If we just, we have to just open our eyes and, and this, you know, and see it. your hearts even more than Yeah, the hearts. Mm -hmm. And what a time we're going through now, the world. If the world ever needed prayer, it's this time. The one and, thing and, I missed most was music when I went away in retreat. I, I was going yeah. nuts. Oh. Uh, well, I, see, I have films I want to make. I want to make a, a, a film. I made one film, uh, but I, my son-in-law finished it because, uh, it was great, but um, but and it showed on PBS. But I would like to do film. Um, but I want to make a film called Women. Uh, look at look at the Middle East. Look at the men screaming and yelling and running around the streets with guns and firing them up in the air. Now try to superimpose women in there. Does it ever occur to anybody? Oh, by the way, look at the economy. Look how well the economy does over there, with the greatest riches in the world, with all the oil. Look at. Does it ever make? Maybe they might question that maybe women might be entered into the picture. Does it ever occur? It takes a five-year-old to figure that out. It's so absurd. So I would like, I mean, I've seen, the, you know, like when 9-11 happened, we, I was making this film about my daughter's trio, the Aurora trio. And I wanted, we didn't do it, but I wanted right away, because, you know, the Taliban was, you know, killing women that didn't do what, whatever they wanted them to do. And here, my daughter's trio, we're making a movie about this trio, and this music that's being created for them, it was shown 400 times on public television. I wanted to bring out this, to show the two contrasts between the Taliban and what was happening in this country. And then there's, there's this woman, a violinist, you ever get to hear her, Fisher. Her last name is Fisher, and I forget what her first name is, but she's phenomenal, she's about 21, 22. She was playing with us, and it, you know, the point is that for people to start understanding the great arts and, and the, the great spiritual things that are happening, they need entree, they need some way to get in sometimes, the door, I mean, when you look at... The, and here was this woman, Fisher, playing the Beethoven Violin Concerto with us. She was, it was exquisitely beautiful, but okay. But here she was, she had the figure of a ballerina. And she played at one many times. Everywhere else, a shot, way back like this. She's playing with her back arms, and you could have superimposed. I would like to do this with her in the film, with a person in gymnastics or ballet, a person who who is the greatest in what they're doing, because she was bending as great as anyone else. So, oh, we become musicians. So with it, no, you. You have no idea. It opens. It's so relevant, you know, to what you do. So anyway, so that. So I don't know. Um, I, I don't want to bore you anymore. But I, I just wanted to come down and you play still for you. Owe us the Bach. Okay. The Bach. 
Yeah. Well, that was the Bach, that, that, yeah, yes, the era of the g -Stern. Yes, you're right. Thank no, you. No, no, but I can give you a little more Bach. Here, I'll give you something else. He, at 1717... I was sort of expecting one of those un uh, uh, unaccompanied cello. That's what I'm going to give you. I'll give you something. Okay. Okay, uh, 1717. This is 1726. In 1717, Bach wrote suites for the cello, unaccompanied. Now, what I just played for you had... You could tell, even though there was accompaniment, it didn't matter because the melody was so strong. But in this, he's got to write everything. He writes the accompaniment. He writes, and he writes, and he does all kinds of tricks. Now, watch my head. I will show you the two different cellists going on at the same time. classes on, on creativity, uh, talking about creativity, what do I, it's bullshit. The point is, is get out of the way, because it has nothing to do with you. Of myself, I can do nothing. And that's what Bach was doing. He was only doing what was coming to him. And we have to have the courage to do whatever's coming to us at the moment. And if we listen, and I'm talking to myself, I'm not talking to you guys. I'm talking if I could just be quiet and listen. And, you know, this is an interesting time in my life where I'm, I'm leaving. And I want to be, I want to serve God. I want to do something. And, but, you know, I don't know. And so I've got to be still and I've got, you know, I have to do it. Okay, I, while you're still listening, it's terrible. I'll give you just a couple other things. Like, for instance, what he does is he plants a note in your ear. Have you got the time? If you don't, you know, we could quit anytime. No, I just I'm curious because of the date difference between the existence of the instrument, the existence of the bow, and the writing of the music prior to the existence of the of bow. This particular that's a great. Different bow. No, no, that's 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 no, but you have a very good point, yeah. and this is this is the big debate that's going on. And actually, it shows you. I'm telling you inside stuff. What's happening in the St. Louis Symphony is the ancient instrument technique is now becoming popular. And uh, that's another reason why I want to leave, not because I don't like them at all, I love them. Um, it's a new era, and they'll go through it. They may be right, I don't think they are, but that's all right. Now, because, you see, there's a debate about whether there was forte or piano in Bach's time. There was, to a degree, but it wasn't the same. But it doesn't change the fact that Bach wrote a, uni a universal language which can be jazzed up today. It can be, they've done it on computers. It's the just the most, singers. pardon? The single singers. Yeah, oh yeah, they, they were great, I love that. I love that. And you know, the thing is that that, so it's, it's debatable. Now I play, for instance, I audition people, I've been auditioning people for 36 years. And uh, when they play this box suite, oh boy, my bow's getting tight, I have to, um, this is a, this is a, I, 
play it differently. I play it a... And the reason I do it, and I don't take anything away from them, it's all your individual thing. I think Bach was going la 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 He planted that note in your ear. So I play it like this. much to it and he was even he went so far as to do this write a four-part fugue what it's impossible for one instrument you know fugues are oh impossible watch that's the fugue voice but he also writes an accompaniment because that note goes on in your ear It's just, it's an incredible, isn't that incredible? I envy your students. I envy your students because, you know, some of this music I've heard it before, but I didn't hear it that way. Yeah. When you when you introduce really oh, yes. the complexity that's going on at that in, in Bach's mind, and how he blends it all together, that one person can play this on this instrument. And it's, not, it's, 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 it's amazing. It's, it's so amazing, and, and what it has the power of, of helping us, like I, I was telling somebody, I, I went through a real depression about 25 years ago, and the cello was my, I have to go back, I came out of it, but, uh, but uh, the, you know, the, 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 uh, but it wasn't medicine, <laughs> it was, you know, my love of this, and, and I'm still learning how to play. I, I have to tell you, I feel like, you know, an imposter at times, and um, that's my thing, is that, you know, I survived for four, 46 years, and I don't know what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. You know, I that's right. that's amazing. Yeah. 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 Uh, it's it's enjoying the club. Right. Yeah, you know? <laughs> Isn't that so it's, much to come to this summer thing? Oh, uh, well, we don't you, give you, up. You, you said you had a story about Yitzhak Perlman. Oh, yeah. Well, Yitzhak Perlman is one of the funniest guys in the world. Yeah. And he's a, he's a great guy. I went out to dinner with him with the concert master about three years ago, and we were laughing the whole time. He's, he did the jokes, which were, I wish I could remember. Oh, I wish I could remember the one joke he did. Um, with the, 
he did one, you know, of course, the minister, the priest, and the rabbi. He has many of those. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to tell you, it's a story that I just think is, and, and when that man walks out on the podium, you know, he's paralyzed, and, and um, he's gone through, you know, operations and everything. And he was our interim conductor for two years, and he's very powerful. <clears throat> Something I can imagine, I mean, make yourself a violinist, and you're auditioning to get in our orchestra. And they play behind a screen, 150, whatever, come in. Maybe three get picked. And I was at one of these auditions. This is not the story I'm going to tell you, but, <clears throat> but it builds on this. And the three players came out. Well, what do you think those three violinists think when they walk out and now they finally see who's sitting there in the audience besides us? It's up for them. <laughs> Hard as hell. <laughs> and I felt, I had a little bit difference of opinion, and I felt that that we were not taking that into account. And one player we turned down, who I voted for, was uh, got in the Chicago Symphony. This doesn't mean anything. Wait, wait, you'll see. Everything has a way of working out in life. And I, I wasn't angry at Itzhak. I, I was a little perturbed at my colleagues because I think they were overly impressed. They have to. You have to be able to make your own decision. I don't care who that person is there. Mm -hmm. And I felt bad about this violinist didn't make it, and she got into Chicago and making $20,000 a year more than us, and were we right? Okay, well, just to take care of that story, um, I, I didn't want to be on it. I, I, I was getting close to leaving, and I didn't want to be on any more committees, and the only committee I would be on <clears throat> was going to be the cello audition. But before that, I had to go play in a quartet with the, the finalists from the next year when they did this violin again, and Itzhak is on the board. I have to tell you, they got a violinist even better than the one that went to Chicago. A Romanian girl, unbelievable violence. So those things have a way if coming again. But <clears throat> we came to the cello auditions, and I said, I'm not going to let. I, you know, I'm going to make my own decisions. You know, that. And so we we got down to the last three, and Itzhak was for a different cellist than I was, and we had a nice, you know, conversation. And so I said, that, and one of the things was the point I want to make here is that what a man he is. Um, because ultimately I won. And he just laughed about it and was the nicest, sweetest guy. But I also know what he was looking for, and I know what I was looking for, for the section and for what, what's going on. And everything is in a state of evolving. And I knew what the orchestra is now evolving to and what they needed. But, um, and, and I, when I, we, were, we couldn't agree, and I said, how about if we, because everybody was sitting in different places in the hall to listen to me, I said, how about we go up on the stage? And at this point, most of the time he moves. He moves on a, on a, on a machine that takes him in. So we went up and he went all, He took all the trouble to go out on the stage. And then we listened and we, the, the young man that I was trying to get did make it and they voted for him and it's like went along. He was such a gentleman about that. Now, to me, that's something very important because he didn't win, but he didn't lose. <laughs> You know, he, he, he was, he was a, he's a great, he's a great man, and what he's done for us, and I mean, oh, he gets up on the podium with his crutches. He still walks out on the stage with crutches, crutches, and to get up, and you're just looking and hoping, and then when he gets down, he puts down that, that crutch, and you're just, you don't want him to fall, and he doesn't, but you don't know how the hell he does it, and he goes through this whole thing, and that during the whole time. He's working with us. He was conducting us. His gentleman, Lenny, and his good humor and his empowering kind of approach. And it's so funny because the concertmaster would say something, ah, and, 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 and it's like, go, yes, we'll do it this way. This is what we should be doing. Of course, everybody knew that he was imitating, that he, that he was making believe it was his idea. Mm -hmm. And he was not ashamed to, you know, to give credit, but he was just making fun <laughs> of that whole fact. He, he's a great guy. I really love him very much. Okay.